I'd like to know how many of you have been in a photograph similar to this one in your life? Uh, of those of you who found yourself in the situation, um, did you consider it sort of stepping over a threshold into a, a new stage in your life? Yes, I see your nods. Yes. Well, confirmation as an event um, is found in most Christian denominations that have infant baptism, but it has both religious and secular connotations. It's partly a reaffirmation of a pledge that other people made for one when one was baptized, and it's also uh, a secular coming of age event in a community or a local society. This lovely gentleman is the person responsible for establishing the right of confirmation in Denmark. This is King Christian VI. He had a, only a 16-year reign. Um, two of the notable things that he did, one was to establish the Stallensbond, which made peasants tied to the land that they were born in and they couldn't freely move around anymore. And then in 1736, he passed a law making it a legal requirement that young people confirm their baptismal promises when they became considered adults as a way of strengthening ties to Christianity and the church. Despite the way he's dressed, he was a pietist. This was a movement, a religious movement that was sweeping through Europe and very popular at this point in time. And this was his effort to um, make Denmark more religious. You have to remember at this point in time, Lutheranism was the state church in Denmark. And except for the Jewish residents of the country, everybody had to be Lutheran. They had to be baptized. They had, could only marry in the Lutheran church. And of course, they were buried in the local Lutheran cemetery. Um, confirmation gradually became viewed as sort of an entrance examination for participation in both religious life and also in the community life. Uh, children usually got their education from the local parish schoolmaster or the parish pastor, because those were often the two people in the local community who had any type of education at all. And once a year or prior to confirmation, they were examined in their catechism and in the, their knowledge of Christianity overall. And they were also given an examination or a grade on how their behavior was during the catechism classes. I don't know if any of you ever had that experience at all. Um, confirmation most commonly was held in the spring, but it depended on how big the parish was. And many parishes also held confirmation classes and confirmations in the fall. And when you got to the larger towns and cities, it wouldn't just be on one Sunday in the spring, one Sunday in the fall. It may fall over a number of Sundays. And um, so you have to sometimes fish around for the records a little bit. The first records of confirmation that went into the church books were merely lists like this one. And it was very common that the boys here were separate, listed separately from the girls. Or often very commonly, the boys came first in the list, followed by the girls, too. Um, but they just had their names um, and no other particulars or information. Sometimes you can, if they're using the patronymics like Joachim's daughter, um, you can, Matisse, you can you see what the first name of the father is. But there is no uh, record here of who belongs to whom, just that they were resident in this particular parish. This is from 1788. From 1810 or so on, one had to have proof of vaccination against smallpox or proof that one had had natural smallpox. And this commonly was recorded in the uh, confirmation records. You could not be confirmed without showing proof one way or the other of these um, of smallpox. And without this vaccination certificate, which is very important and which many immigrants brought with them over to this country, um, you couldn't attend school. You couldn't be confirmed, of course. You couldn't get an apprenticeship. You couldn't serve in the military. You couldn't get married. You couldn't act as a godparent. And you couldn't vote. And this was the case for many, many years. 
Generally speaking, um, school in Denmark in the 19th century started at age seven and was mandatory for seven years. So it usually ending around age 14. And this was considered the time when you became an adult and entered the workforce. In some records, like this one here from the Bulldolphy Parish in Anbor, um, the children, for one reason or another, were not quite 14 when they went through confirmation classes, and they had to get a special dispensation from the bishop allowing this. In this case, Stina Jenstad of Pope here, she was just lacking a couple of days of being confirmed, of being 14 at the time. But because her father was a fairly high official in the local government and a member of the, the he was a Danapool's man, um, you know, that dispensation was probably fairly easily come by. Um, you see this fairly uh, commonly, especially if a child has had to go out and work before the age of 14. Those who did, who had, because of poverty in their families, um, had to uh, accept a lower pay for their farm help or their domestic service because they weren't considered adults. So again, confirmation marked a time when they could then go out and get uh, a better standard of living for themselves. In many of the local parishes, the way the confirmation was done is that the young people were examined and given their grades, and then they were uh, assigned a position in a line, and they processed into the church based on their grades, and uh, were seated at the end of the pews. So uh, if you were at the back of the church, that your family might be rather embarrassed, and of course there were always rumors flying around the local community, it's the same time here, that sometimes a, a wealthier farmer or a, a tradesman might give a donation to the church upkeep in return for a, a more forward position for his or her child, or whatever. This isn't always true. For example, this young man here is number 29. In, but we don't know if that's number 29 out of 30 or out of 150 people being confirmed. So, but when you look at the confirmation records, there will always have a number uh, next to them. And so if it's a rather small class, there's a good chance that those with the lower numbers are the ones with the higher grades that you will find. The grades were like this, and this was a system that was used in the schools back as far as into the 1960s even. And I've sort of arbitrarily put assigned what we would call these grades. And the vast majority of them usually got the MG, my gut grade. I have found a couple of TGs, especially among boys, and uh, one slit, you know, record in that. So, you know, in most cases, but it's very interesting because that sort of sheds a little light on your ancestors' um, wiggliness in confirmation classes, perhaps, is what grade they got for behavior. Once a person was confirmed, there were two books that very commonly became part of their, in their came into their possession. One is a Skuzmo's book, or a, an employment book, or a character reference book. This was issued by the local pastor when the child was going into the workforce. And it would have the information about the person, their name, parents' names, and when and where they were confirmed. And this book went with the, the person um, from one job to the next, and the various um, individuals, would, uh, employers, would write notes in it about when the person started work, when they left their employment, and often something about how well they performed the tasks that they were assigned. Um, most children, of course, had to go out and work because there was very little opportunity for advanced education. It was just the fewest students or young people who could go on to some other education. And a lot of parents, of course, could not afford to buy an apprenticeship for their, their children to learn a skilled trade, for example. You had to have this book, and without it, you couldn't get work legally, and you were either left to beg or um, do other illegal things. I have a 
four times great grandfather who was in prison a couple of times on bread and water because he apparently defaced his book. Whether he wrote, marked things out, tore pages out, or dropped in the mud puddle while drunk, I'm not quite sure. But, but you know, there were serious consequences if you lost this book. And again, many of our Danish immigrant ancestors brought them with them the books when they came to this country because it showed potential employers, at least Danish ones, what their previous experience was. The other book of importance was a Salma book, or the hymnal. And they often look like this one here, palm-sized. In churches they didn't have hymnals and the, you know, everybody brought their own. So this was a very, very common confirmation gift. So the other side that you were an adult was you had your very own hymnal. And so there's a couple of examples of those. Those again were brought to this country and often in published in this country in similar versions in Danish first and then in English. And um, we get offered tons of them every year, you know, because people can't read the Danish anymore. And so we have a good sample of different kinds of hymnals in our collections. For genealogists, the, all the Danish church records are, have been digitized and they're online for free, which is wonderful. And of course, Murphy's Law being the way it is, I downloaded this image of how you get to the website yesterday, and today they changed the whole look of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the records are all in Danish, but it's fairly, they're fairly easy to use once you get used to it, and we'd be more than happy to help you, you know, in person or, or through the telephone even, uh, work your way through it until you get familiar with how to use these records. For me as a genealogist, confirmation records are extremely important because they provide a lot of different kinds of information, and we, it's not something we tend to think of as a record when we're going out looking for vital records. For example, they, uh, they off, the confirmation records will always say when a person was born or baptized and where. And this is pretty important. We get a lot of people coming in saying, my ancestor was born in such and such a place. And then when we look at the, rec the records for that place, we can't find any record of that, that birth. Often what's happened is they were confirmed in that place and maybe even grew up there, but were born somewhere else. And so by looking at the confirmation records, we can find out, oh, well, they were born in the parish next door or 200 miles away or whatever, um, and, and then go to find the correct record. If you, a person lived in a large city like Alborg or Copenhagen or Aarhus, you often get the actual street that the person lived on, and even the floor, and, and whether they lived in the apartment to the left or the apartment to the right, many times you'll find this. Um, it's in this instance from uh, one of the parishes in Copenhagen, and in this instance we find that she was actually born and baptized in a town called Sorø, which was quite a distance from Copenhagen, but still on the island of Zealand. So this is an instance where if we knew she came from Copenhagen, because maybe she immigrated from there, you know, you could search many of the Copenhagen parishes, you know, until you gray-haired, but this confirmation record would say where you should be looking instead. The also one valuable thing is that the confirmation records give the names of the parents, which is something we'd like to have as genealogists but also indicate if the parents are living or not. So in this case, this mass Tony Sun Yule, his father is Tönnes Christiansen Yule, and his mother is the deceased Maren Mastetta Tuwesen. So we can know when we're looking at other records, census records and other church records, whether we should be bothering to look for the mother as a living person or not, or if you maybe we're going to try and find our death record. Back to this little record here. This is a sample of the smallpox vaccination record that would be put on the confirmation. In this case, this young man was vaccinated in 1808, and it says who it was. And also, this is where, instead of doing grade, this particular pastor 
wrote an essay, a mini essay, about this young man, Hans Christian Andersen. And given his later prominence as a fairy tale author, and <laughs> so I think it's very nice that you know he was showing his his intellectual abilities this early on, and somebody saw fit to note that. So whether he was number 29 out of 30, or you know, uh, since he was the son of a shoemaker and of very modest circumstances, you know, he might you know his parents obviously couldn't pay to move him up. In the in the row, but somebody has noted the fact that he he was an intelligent person. So these you know are things that add flesh to the bones when you're doing type of genealogy. For you people who have ancestors that are down in slave state or Sunni Yunnan, you have an extra challenge is that the records can fluctuate between being written in Danish or in German, such as in this case when people parish in 1885, which was about 20 years after the Germans took over this part. It's not consistent at all, and sometimes the records will be in both languages too. But at least, you know, they're clearly written and they do give the same information about who the parents are, when the person was born, and a variety of other things along that line. In 1848, Denmark had a liberal constitution passed, and one of the stipulations was that there was freedom of religion in Denmark. And this brought in Mormon missionaries, Baptist missionaries, uh, Methodists, and a variety of other people in. And they started proselytizing and establishing churches of other denominations. And this proliferated. Fortunately for us, um, these records, or many of them, have also been uh, digitized, so you can find records. Uh, this is a little Emmanuel Nielsen, who became a very prominent Methodist minister over in this country, in the Wisconsin area. And he was, uh, this is his confirmation record from the Methodist Church on Bornholm, where he was born. When you get to U.S. records, done, and it's not true just simply of confirmation records, but also birth and marriage and, and death records. The pastors who first came here, of course, and served the various immigrant communities were Danish trained. Um, and often they followed the Danish model when they set up their church books, although they didn't have the same types of church books that they were used to in Denmark. So for example, this is from Hampton, Nebraska, confirmation class of 1906. And we have individuals, we have the boys first and then the girls, names of parents, uh, where they were baptized, whether it's in their community, the congregation or elsewhere. And then this pastor used the grading, the Danish grading system. So dear old Arthur Anderson here got a TG, which is that sort of D. Um, he was the worst of the records. And then they also have some remarks here about whether the parents were members of the congregation or not, which can be useful to know. But as a lot of the pastors, of course, had um, to serve more than one congregation, and they all also didn't always have pre-printed forms to use. So you find these records in a variety of different ways. And I just took a couple of samples from local uh, congregations. This is from Elkhorn, the Conference of 1914. Um, that means they were born around 1900. And it gives, again, their names, their parents, their birth date here, uh, where they were born, and then the Bible verse that they or the, you know, went along with when they were confirmed. Um, and this is very, very useful because sometimes we don't know when our immigrant ancestors exactly came, or where they settled before. So it's nice to know that this Arndt Klot here, or Cloth, he was born in Fremont, Nebraska. You might not know that the family lived in Fremont prior to coming to the Elkhorn area. Uh, or Carrie Bow down here, she was born in Slatesby on the island of Ulss. So this means being born around 1900, her family had not yet immigrated to the United States. So you, you know, you narrow your time frame down when you're looking for those types of records. This is two samples from the Kimbleton Church book, 1896 and 1919. You can see in 1896, pretty hasty notes with just the names, like the very earliest Danish records. 
By 1919, the pastor at least was putting the birth and baptismal dates down of the individuals, but not linking them to families, particularly, or their, or their birthplaces weren't there either. A lot of Danish rural residents, especially, but townies as well, were fairly what not well off. And poverty and the fact that they had to be frugal meant that children generally wore hand-me-down clothes from older siblings or from adults in the family. So part of the transition to adulthood was that when you got confirmed, you got a set of new clothes. And this was very important. And even more importantly, these clothes were not your usual children's clothes. They were grown up apparel in one way or another. When uh, King the Christian uh, mandated the law in 1736, he mandated also what girls were supposed to wear. Um, they had to wear a dress that was either black or white, and it had to be very simple and could have no decoration on it unless it was on the same fabric, and the neck had to be covered. And so we see the evolution of high-necked, often black confirmation dresses being worn, especially out in rural areas, by women, and this confirmation dress, often you know, homemade, would serve as their best dress for many years to come. And indeed, some women were married in the same dress and even buried in the same dress. Hard to believe in these days. But in some areas, uh, the local population held on to regional <coughs> dress or elements of it for many, many years, and so this also was an opportunity for a young girl to get her first adult clothing, which would be fairly elaborate and follow the local patterns in terms of, of scarves and bonnets and that type of thing. Generally speaking, when uh, women who were wearing traditional dress, they started with something simple, and as an occasion got more festive, they added on. You know, so they would have multiple layers. But often for confirmations, you sort of, the girls start with sort of a basic outfit similar to this one here. By the time that most of our ancestors were coming over here, however, festive dress <coughs> tended to follow the more urban fashions, and, and, but they were still intended to be extremely practical and be something that you could wear for many, many years. Another aspect that you will see is this is often the first time that young girls will wear their hair in a grown-up style. Young girls often wore braids or um, simple buns or that type of thing, but getting, getting your hair set up on top of your head was a, and covered with a bonnet was a sign that you were an adult. And this was something to be looked forward to in many instances. Um, and also the boys, often they would get their first full suit of clothing. And uh, you can see this one, it would include a vest and a jacket or a coat. And also, do you notice the all-important leather shoes instead of wooden clogs? For families who had children who were being confirmed locally, it was a matter of prestige that their children be suitably attired for the event. And the shoes extremely were important because if a compromised man had to wear those clogs, which you know often they went barefoot during the, the good weather and just wore the clogs when it was you know, bad weather, um, that was really embarrassing. And, and so families would struggle to save money ahead of time um, in order to buy the proper clothing or to have it sewn for them. So there, in some areas, they had actual sort of confirmation insurance societies that you could contribute money to, you know, ahead of time to so you have enough to buy your, your outfits. Or a family might start just a private confirmation fund and contribute money to that. You can see that this form of dress, uh, having a, a dark up the dress primarily that was very useful and would show dirt was also um, something that followed over into this country as well. Um, you might also see, um, gradually around the turn of the last century, we're going to start seeing the appearance of white uh, dresses for girls. 
these dresses, of course, had less flexibility in where you could wear them. And so the concept of end day's toy or second day clothes came into vogue as well, if you could afford it. And this was a set of clothes that might include an adult-style coat or a hat, and as well as a good dress of one sort. So we'll look at a couple of pictures from about this time period, as we see the gradual transition from all-purpose dresses like these into white dresses in both Denmark and America. Um, and at the same time, you'll notice this isn't shown here, but in the next picture, there's two, just two individuals right there, formal dresses on. You start seeing the appearance of white dresses and the use of corsages as sort of a way of marking the fact that you were a compromand. So this is Elkhorn in 1906, and Hampton, Nebraska in the same year. And the, white, the use of white dresses carried on for many, many decades. I don't know how many of you who were confirmed wore a white dress? Some of you? White robe. White robe? Before white robe. Okay. We'll get to that in a moment. Okay. Um, so they, the styles, of course, changed with the fashions. But uh, as you'll see in these pictures coming up here, the white dresses persisted. So here's Elkhorn in 1934. 1942, you know, there was a war on, there was a fabric shortage, so you didn't spend a lot of money on, on fabric, you know, for your dresses, so skirt line, hem lines went up, definitely. And this is 1948. The, the custom of new clothing was also served as a reinforcement to symbolize the new life that you were entering. You were leaving behind your former life and beginning the, your new life as an adult. And, and for the first few generations in this country of Danish immigrants and their children, eighth grade education was usually the end of schooling, formal schooling. So the significance is a, is a time period, you know, persisted well into the 20th century. And sometime around the middle of the 20th century, it became a custom in many Lutheran churches, at least, for confirmants to wear what I call choir robes. <laughs> That's what they looked for. Um, this is one from Chicago in 1946. And here we find, this is just one year after that last Elkhorn picture, they had changed pastors in the meantime, and apparently he felt like this was the way to go. Um, this is the kind of garb I wore when I was confirmed, but underneath, I had a nice, you know, I had top to toe new clothing, you know, definitely, and I'm sure many of these other young people did too. Associated with uh, confirmation is often some sort of party or festive occasion, and we can bring that back to uh, the future King Frederick IV, who had one of the first confirmation parties on record in 1784. And this picture is probably from a year or two later than that, and presumably he did not wear that when he was confirmed. You know, the, but the case, as is the case with many other things, the upper classes immediately thought, ah, the, the royal family can have a confirmation party, then we have to have one too. And gradually, this idea of holding a special dinner or something along that line, a party, filtered down through the various layers of society. Um, although even into the 1930s and the Depression years, it was not at all uncommon for poor families not to do, make a big deal out of it. You know, perhaps they might prepare a, a fairly special dinner for their confirmand and give a few modest presents, but it wasn't a, a big splash by any means. This young girl in Denmark was confirmed in 1930, and she's sort of a case in point. She was the youngest of 16 children, and her mother died about a year after she was born, and her father sort of had odd jobs in the brother hand to mouth. So her confirmation was a party wasn't a fancy one, and the only guests were her older brothers and sisters and their families if they had them. 
Um, in poor families, it was very common that you had to start working before you were confirmed. And this was the case of all of Anna's older brothers and sisters. But maybe because she was the last one, she, yes, she was a special case. And she later remarked in life that she was very happy that she was allowed to be confirmed before she had to go out into the workforce. What we think of as confirmations in the more modern time in Denmark, that began to change after the austere years of World War II with the German occupation and the post-war years immediately afterwards when there was a lot of rationing and not a lot of the things that were available. Um, generally speaking, during this time period, what confirmants would get as gifts would be something durable. So it was common for watches and bicycles and cameras for boys. And girls often got very good jewelry or a start on their silverware you know, collection that they would have when they got married. Another post-war uh, collection that came into to fashion was that of Blue Monday, which is Blue Monday. This is something taken over from Germany, apparently, where the day after the kids are confirmed, they skip school or skip work and, and go downtown to show off their finery and to have fun and show it to other families. I don't know if Johannes or Charlotte have followed this custom at all. Maybe they can say something about it. If a family was more affluent, of course, they could make a big deal out of it. And such was the case with Annette Abek Floystrup. Her family had immigrated to the United States when she was four years old. And when she was of confirmation age, they went back to calling to have her confirmed all by herself by the minister who had baptized her. And it was made a big deal in the paper. You know, her parents, and she had a couple of siblings, um, you know, could afford to do this. And it's just a very common, uh, typical picture of a confirmant from the 1960s. And Annetta was very pleased for our display to um, show us some of the things that she had kept from her confirmation. One of it was a couple of the songs that her family members had written for her confirmation. And like most festive occasions, you can't have one without songs. You know, they may be written by family members or by a professional songwriter, but she indeed had a couple of these. But also I thought was interesting is that they had a sit-down dinner at a restaurant in Colleen for 40 adults and four children. And this is 1964, and it came to 2,450 kroner and 75 euro. Big dinner. She made the remark that if one went to restaurant Nim in Copenhagen, you probably couldn't get one meal for that amount of money. But this was certainly big bucks back in the 1960s. Confirmation is a rite of passage. It has changed considerably in recent de decades in Denmark, partly because there's lengthier education requirements, and then there's also changes in the social structure of mores, which have diluted its original meaning. When young people in Denmark get con confirmed today, it doesn't mark an end to their education. And then as Danes have become less religious, the original intent of the event has become somewhat diluted. Although, if you do go to confirmation classes in Denmark, my understanding is that they have changed very little over the years. The pastor will still say you have to attend so many uh, preparation classes and perhaps even go to church on Sundays for a period of time. And the, the ceremony itself remains basically the same. But many people view the confirmation as a secular event, as a coming of the age party. And it, by the 1970s, um, we see a lot of non-formations parties, which is a secular party without the church part of it. Um, this began in 1915 as a public alternative to church confirmations and was often held in the town hall, um, but through the decades became more and more of a private event. Um, in 2000, about 80% of the Danish teenagers who were eligible to be confirmed chose to do so and follow their traditional confirmation. This was Jesper's cousin Frederica, who in 19, 2013 was confirmed in Denmark. 
And at that point, she was one of about 70% of the children who were choosing that, uh, to follow tradition with that. In the United States, because legal adulthood and voting and its rights become, it comes at the age of 18, and basic education now goes to consist of high school and even beyond, confirmation doesn't serve as any type of secular coming of age function either. But it still remains a pretty strong religious event in most denominations and still serves that original purpose that was set out in 1736 by an autocratic Danish monarch. It's a reaffirmation of one's baptismal pledge. And then various churches will have other activities incorporated into the event um, to make it as meaningful and personal for the various ones who are confirmed. And Pastor Mentor was very uh, gracious to share with me the, these two photos of recent confirmants and also the banners that each of them create to indicate what confirmation means to them. We understand that they're displayed in the church on the confirmation day. If you would like to see many more pictures and stories of confirmations, you can go to the museum webpage and look at online media here, and then go down the sideline to the confirmation section, and there's many more stories and pictures of people and from various time periods, Denmark and the United States, that you can, you can see. Uh, and if you have any questions at all about finding your own ancestors' confirmation records, we'll be more than happy to try and help you find them. Thank you.